We're still dealing with Jubilee, and God is just really beginning moving on me. For us to go into what God really wants for us, we've got to change some things in our lives. You know, I've heard it defined that the absolute definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And how many know the, the world has really contaminated the church? It's contaminated our philosophies. It's contaminated our ideologies. Uh, it has contaminated our, the way that we even see the world around us. And so God is calling us to realign ourselves, to open up our hearts. In fact, one of the things, and I'm kind of entering into dialogue with another researcher, that one of the problems we have with understanding spirit, soul, and body is that spirit and soul uh, throughout the Word of God are interchangeable. They're, they're kind of blended together. And so some say there's really no difference. But I, I think part of our problem is we look at everything through Greco-Roman eyes. And Michael, if you would go ahead and turn off that air conditioner now. It's gotten cool enough in here. Don't need to, anybody getting frostbite during church. And my mother said, thank you, Jesus. Um, but the Greco-Roman mindset is linear logic. We look at things completely. Semitic is, is block logic. They, they set two truths together. They say, hey, they're perfectly true. The whole argument between Calvinism and Arminianism doesn't exist within rabbinical circles because they said, what's the problem? The mystery in between is God. How do you take the absolute sovereignty of God and set it next to the free will of man? Well, only the Almighty can. And sometimes we can't connect the dots. And so really understanding the difference, it's almost like, you know, the diagram that I had, and, and it, I, th I think it still didn't really show. I did it as a pie for one reason. If a rabbi looked at man, he would say the outer crust of the pie is your body. And the two ingredients that make the inside of the blueberries and the sugar, they're completely blended together and they harmonize with one another. You don't want to separate them, and you can't, although you could say originally they were, and that's the spirit and the soul. But the spirit and the soul will remain forever. Once you, once you cook them in the pie, how many know that the sugar and the blueberries are forever one? And so we, we need to understand some things, and, and actually we need to have the foundational understanding of our plane of reality defined by the Word. I mean, there's so much more to reality than what you can see. Really. Which really kind of blows away. We, we, we have what is, is called uh, Baconian scientific definition, which comes from Sir Francis Bacon, which was an occultist anyway. But it's like by observation, only if you can see it, if you can touch it. Well, you, you start getting into theoretical physics, and they set all that aside because... You can't see a quark. You can't see the fabric of the universe. So some of the things they're even trying to define for us actually goes against the very definitions of basic science. But how many know that science, really, you can't define it just by what you can see and what you can touch? There's more to it. We, understood, we understand that there's 11 dimensions to our plane of reality. Now, you can only see three of them and experience the fourth one. It's called time. So there's seven more out there that you can't see, you can't touch, you can't smell, but we know that they're there. It's pretty well a proven thing within, within science. So there's so much more than what we can understand. And so to be able to understand how all this works together, how many know you've got to rely on God and his revelation? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God defines everything. You want to find out how the beginning works, how the world works? You've got to go to the beginning of what God said. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, when we look at this, there's, there, I, I have dealt with that many believe that there is a time gap between verse 1 and 2. How many know God does not make junk? He does not make things imperfect. And there is, in the language in the Hebrew that is in verse 2, that the world became void. The world became uh, without form. There, there was something that caused crea uh, chaos, and many believe it was the fall of Lucifer. 
But one of the things, even if you don't believe that, if you don't believe in the pre-Adamic race and this time gap, one of the things that you, that you have to come to grips with is we always say God, that creation began when God spoke, right? But the earth was there before God spoke. The earth was there and in a chaotic form before he said, let there be light. Hmm. So when we look and this is God setting, this is the, the plane of existence that you are in and that we have physical matter in a state of chaos. How many would look right now at the earth and say it's in chaos once again? Okay. We have the spirit of God enveloping the earth. We always say, well, he was just over the water. That's all there was. There was no such thing as dry ground until God created it a couple of days later. The entire planet was underwater. And so the, the Spirit of God enveloped the entire planet. He was over the entire planet. And we have God, we have God speaking into the earth, and the Holy Spirit brings his words to pass in the physical realm. So the, the, the way to get order, the way to bring healing is God has got to breathe commands into this earth realm that takes the physical matter and makes it something different. Now that ought to make you go, hmm, just a little bit. So any change in this planet has got to come by something that is spirit-breathed. It always starts in the spirit first, and then it begins to manifest in the physical realm. Now, we need to understand a couple of things about the Holy Spirit. One of them is the Holy Spirit is known in Scripture as the breath of God, the ruach, the breath. In Job 33 and 4, it says, And the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. That the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. God breathed and the Holy Spirit moved. Can you talk without breath coming out of your mouth? God can't speak without the Holy Spirit moving. He is the breath of God. In fact, ruach in the Hebrew means breath, wind, or spirit. So literally when we see the Spirit of God in the Hebrew, ruach ha'olohim, it can also be the breath of God. The wind of God. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He just goes wherever he wants. And you don't know where he comes or where he goes, but you see the manifestation of him. You're going you're gonna to catch this in a minute. So the Holy Spirit plus the spoken word of God changes physical matter. It could also be said that the breath of God plus the command of God brought order to the chaos of this world. How many are ready for some order in your life? I'm tired of the devil constantly causing chaos in my life. Now, in the midst of this, God makes man. And it said, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we have God took physical matter, and he made a clay vessel. Is there any wonder why the prophet called the Almighty the potter and us the clay? He asked you to look back in Bereshit in Genesis and said, listen, God formed you once before. If you let him take his hands, he can form you once again. And how many of us know there's hope for us broken vessels, us cracked pots in the kingdom of God that the potter can put us back on the wheel and heal and mend us? But when God took physical matter and he breathed, and he breathed, he released the ruach, the breath of life, the Holy Spirit into the nostrils of man, and man became a living soul. Now, in the Hebrew, that is nefesh. Nefesh, and, and the Hebrew can mean the soul, it can mean the spirit, and it can mean the body. 
It's the whole package deal, although the, the, the idea with the nephesh, it can, it can, it's like all three of them are there, but whichever one kind of comes to the forefront at the minute, anybody ever get in the flesh or get in the spirit or sometimes have your soul take over in the wrong way? You see, each one can kind of come to the forefront, but yet it's all one thing. And so uh, a rabbi would say, well, that's the manifestation of the nephesh, the whole package deal. Although you can see aspects of the, of the tripartness of man the manifesting at different times. But God doesn't stop there. He said, now, why did God breathe? Why did God speak into man? We find this in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said. It was the breath of life to man was the breath of authority. The breath of dominion. When You say, well, how could God create male and female... Yeah, he created Adam first, and then he had to take Eve. Did you know that when God made the body of Adam, he made Adam and Eve as one? If God has everything within himself, so did man. Eve was resident on the inside of him just waiting for God to separate him out and divide the two because man needed a help meet. He couldn't be like God and have everything within him that he needed. In, in this physical realm, he needed the woman. But God said, and God said, and it said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. These words of authority, these words that enabled man to bring order out of the chaos that had been in the planet and maintain and maintain it. God already brought order, but he said, listen, I'm giving you dominion to maintain it. He breathed life into the nostrils of God, of man. Now, on the seventh day, God rested. We celebrate the Sabbath here. Because one of the things that we understand, six days a week, the Bible says, six days shall a man work, and on the seventh day he will rest. The rabbis understand this to mean that the six days, Sunday through Friday, that I, the part of my task in this, me giving this dominion is I continue the creative process of God in the earth. All the technology we have today was that creative force working in man that had a purpose for God, and Satan doesn't create technology, just like everything else, he perverts it for his purposes. To the surprise of some, God, uh, the devil did not create TV. The devil just hijacked it. God created music. The devil hijacked it. God created the airways to proclaim the gospel and to use it in this end time. The devil hijacked it. And see, when God created man, he's the one who gave us the authority to maintain and enforce the order that he established. But it can only come when he breathes through us. Is it starting to click here? Because it all has to start with spirit, then soul, then body. Why does man have to do the Sabbath? Because I've got to remember that it's not me that originated this power to create. It was God. And so six days, the number of man, I am continuing this creative force and then on the seventh day I rest I cease from my labor so I can give recognition to the spirit of God who was blowing through me all week and enabled me to do my job and to do good things in the earth and also do inventory to see in what areas another spirit was blowing uh oh Man and the earth, our plane of reality exists, there exists a spirit, soul, and body connection. To not understand this fact and to not function purposely within it is to give the enemy extraordinary advantages in our life. How many know that a lot of the things that we're seeing in politics now and, and, and all the things that, that are going on, it's, it's almost insane when you look at it from my viewpoint. It's insane. We've got to realize there is a spiritual force behind that that's empowering it. 
How many of that spirit began to manifest when they had the Occupy movement? And not only did you, you have all these people demanding, I want all the rich people to give up, but really when you look at it, guys, when you look on a global scale, the poorest of us in America are the richest in the earth. This whole thing, 99 and 1%, we're, no, no one in America that lives in America can say we're the 99%. You're the 1%, Jack. Even if you only make $10,000 a year, you are the 1% when you look at a global scale. But when you look at there was a spirit breathing through that, and there was hatred, there was anti-Semitism, there began to be spirits of uncleanness take a hold of that to where you begin, well, there, were, there were women being raped that all that was kept silent during these protests. But why, the, why did they finally have to move to shut them down? It's because disease began to break out. Tuberculosis and many other things began to break out because there was a spirit that was generating all of that. Everything has a spiritual component to it. It's only empowered when a spirit breathes through it. And so one of the things God is, is calling us to do in this day and in this hour is determine what spirit is empowering different areas of my life. You see, before you got saved, the devil blew into everything you did. Now, how many know the kingdom of darkness has a multiplicity of demonic forces that can blow through? Whether it's greed, whether it's pride, you know, there's this, there is a whole plethora. And they blew and empowered all these different areas of our lives, and then I get saved. And all of a sudden, a fresh wind begins to blow. But yet, in many areas of my life, I'm used to the other wind. That other wind will always bring you into captivity. It will bring you into bondage. It will bring disorder. It will bring chaos. The New Testament tells us that where there is confusion and every evil work, what is it? It's darkness. God brings order. The devil brings chaos. We even see the same principle in the garden. Prior to Genesis 3, the only one who ever spoke in the earth was Almighty God. Now in Genesis 3, 1 through 5, now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat it, uh, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye, ye eat thereof, ye shall be, your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And so for the first time since, cre since God recreated the earth, another spirit's blowing. I just got through listening to uh, uh, Mike Hesser, and he, he has a Ph.D. in Semitic language. When he opens his mouth immediately, it's about this far over my head when he starts talking the, the, the Semitic languages. But where it talks about the serpent, it's derived from the word seraphim. It can be translated seraphim. And in their research within the prophets, the prophets, will, we have always thought that cherubim and seraphim were two different classes of angels, and they're beginning to find out in the prophets and the writings of Jeremiah and Isaiah that cherubim and seraphim are used interchangeably, kind of like nephesh can represent the soul or the spirit and different things. And so there, there is substantial evidence that a seraphim named Lucifer appeared in the tree in the garden because it can be translated shining one or flaming one. Remember uh, when the children of Israel began complaining and griping in the wilderness and these fiery serpents, seraphim came from the presence of God and said, you know, we've had about enough of this. And it was seraphim that inflicted that pain. So seraph, so it could have very, it, either it was Lucifer possessed this serpent, 
which is very doable, or he simply manifested himself as a shining one because the same word translated serpent is translated in other places in the Hebrew as a seraphim, as a shining one. But another spirit breathed and caught the ears of man and produced something else than what God has said. So, here's where we are with the fall. Another spirit speaks to mankind through the serpent and produces the fall of mankind. The fall starts with a spiritual force breathing into the mind of man. The breath produces thoughts and feelings. And the thoughts and feelings produce action. Everything that you do in your life, a spirit breathes into you and breathes through your will, your mind, and your emotions to produce an action because spirit breathing that changes the will, the mind, and the emotion that produces an action will always create a change in our realm of existence. What we want is we want God to change our life while we're tuned into the wrong channel. You can't have the devil in many areas of your life breathing things through your will, your mind, and your emotions that produces chaos, and you, you want God to come in and supersede all that and to produce order when what, with the very thing that's flowing through you, even as a believer, produces chaos. Now, nobody's ever seen chaos erupt in a church. Church splits, church arguments, church fights. And sometimes when you really step back away from it, it's some of the most silliest things that you ever heard. That grown people really argue about this. Now, maybe little kids on a playground. I, ha I have seen church fights over, th over the decades that sixth graders, fifth graders, fourth graders would not have fought over what happened? Another spirit blew into the church, and it affected. Now, let, 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 me, let me be very clear about this, because this is one of the things that, uh, that I'm learning about me, even. Anybody ever end up with a bad attitude every once in a while? No, it only happens to preachers, okay? You get emotional. Now, there, there can be chemical changes in the body that can affect emotion. There can be chemical imbalances. There can be different things. But that's really a very small percent of all the emotions that you go through. So we'll take that 2 to 3% and we'll set it over here and call it body chemistry. The rest of it, you had a spirit blow through you that elicited an emotion for an action. Come on now. You're going to start... I, I have seen people that just simply enter a room, don't have to say a thing, but it might as well just be the biggest wettest blanket or the biggest bunch of irritation you've ever seen, or somebody can come in and bring joy. Don't even have to say anything. There's a spirit blowing through them that on the inside, your thoughts have power. Your thoughts, without ever speaking them, can affect the, the around you. Your emotions are not just on the inside. You cannot say a word, and they radiate on the outside. Come on now. But what we have never taken into account is there is a spirit that's blowing that produces the emotion. There's a spirit that's blowing that produces the thought. There's a spirit that's blowing that produces the attitude. Now, once we're saved for the first time in our life, we can shut down one spirit and yield to another. Did you know that you can even shut down the Holy Spirit? Grieve not the Holy Ghost, the Bible tells us. Why is he grieved? Because you've opened up your sails to another spirit and it's producing other results in your life. You see, this is all a part of moving in a year of jubilee. You, to get the jubilee, you've got to pull down all your sails to the devil and open up all your sails to the Holy Spirit and begin to let him move. Because the only way that you can release the jubilee is you've got to let a, the Spirit of God blow into your thoughts and your emotions to create an action that produces jubilee.
I need an organ on the side. We want, we want a jubilee to fall on us in spite of ourselves. When the, the, the announcement in Leviticus 25 is, you declare a jubilee, you enact the jubilee, you enforce the jubilee, you go and do the research and find out who what belongs to who and where, and you enforce it in the earth. Because after God brought the initial order, he passed it off to man in the garden when he spoke words of authority to man. And so now man becomes the agent of either chaos or order depending upon who fills his sails. Maybe now for the first time you understand Washington, D.C. They're the only ones that I have ever seen any, and now this happens with any government because how many know the governments of men are nothing compared to the kingdom of God. And so you can take something that is simple that costs a dollar, give it to a government agency, they will make it so complicated that nobody can understand it, that same dollar will now cost them a million dollars. That's why our government was proud of saying how many billions of dollars they took and we created 10,000 jobs. Well, why didn't you just go ahead and take that $6 billion and just divide it up amongst all the people and every one of us could have, you know, 2,000 jobs, $6 billion. It's chaos. It's chaos. The thief comes to steal. Wherever the wind of the devil blows, it will steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus can come along, take a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread and feed the multitude. Different wind blowing. <laughs> so I want to find out how do I get the right wind blowing. I want to know how to pull down my sails to depower the devil and start opening up my sails since I'm born again so the Holy Spirit can begin moving through all of the aspects of my life, not just my church life, but my home life. Those of us that are married, your intimate life, your financial life, raising your kids, all these different things. I want the Holy Spirit blowing through that because every single aspect, it has to start with a spirit empowerment that blows through your will, your mind, and emotions for a physical action. The very first one God began to deal with me, and that's what we're going to deal with primarily this morning, is God's instruction on bringing order from, not for, the enemy's chaos. I'm going to change that. Actually, I got it right in my notes. I just didn't, somehow or another, it didn't show up on the, on the transparency. Number one has to start with the fear of God. How many would like wisdom and knowledge? Did you know that if you don't add a component of the fear of the Lord, you can have knowledge but not really have knowledge? And you can have all this information. How many know there's a difference between data and knowledge? I used to serve in the military, and I, I've also talked to people in the corporate world. The spreadsheets are there, all the data is there, but they look at it and they cannot extrapolate knowledge out of it. You're saying, you're saying, it's right there. We, we, we took in $4 million, and we have spent $17 million. We're going belly up. No, it looks rosy keen to me. There's no knowledge there. And see, wisdom would be how to flip those and make the $17 million and only have to spend $2 million to do it. There's a difference between data and and knowledge and wisdom. The only way to access true knowledge and true wisdom with all the data that has presented to you in the world, it has to start with the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the end of knowledge. No, what does it say? The beginning, the starting point. In Proverbs 9, 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. 
Now let me ask you something. If Adam and Eve had had the fear of the Lord in the garden, would the fall have happened? No. I fear God. I'm not going to listen to you. God said don't eat of that fruit. And so if every other tree in this garden quits yielding any vegetation that I can eat, he will have to bring it with him when he comes in the evening when I walk with him. But I'm not doing this because I fear God. I have a deep reverential fear for Almighty God. When you truly understand what's at stake, how many know that our, our, our eternity is at stake? But so is our here and now. Some of us, I, th I think one of the problems with once saved, always saved, is that you think that you have this eternal security so that you can live like the devil now and get to heaven. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. If you've been in touch by eternity, it will manifest now. And see, I, I, want, I want my hereafter to be established in the kingdom, but I want the kingdom now. That's been one of the problems that uh, the Protestant movement has had in witnessing to Jewish people. Well, why do I want to follow Jesus? Because you get to go to heaven. And that's our selling point. How I many know that's a good selling point? Okay. But the one thing that has been a consternation about the church is what about now? We have no answer for now. The Torah has lots of answers for now. But since we have been, we have been uh, disenfranchised from the Torah in the Christian church, we have no answer for that. And I want to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want to live in a constant hell here. God promised, and this is part of the Shema, that if, that if you obey God's commandments, it will be the days of heaven upon the earth. How I many know we're missing the mark somehow or another? And it's because we don't have a fear of God. And if you don't have a fear of God, you will let whatever spirit that appeases your flesh blow into you. You deserve to feel this way. Oh, if you only, if anybody else only had what happened to you, they would understand how that you're justified and that you have a right to this hatred or this envy or this jealousy or this need to control. If they only knew that spirit will whisper in, into your ear and you will yield to it. But if you have a fear of God, you say, I fear God more. You see, when I read the word, Jesus delivered me from the pain of the past, and now I have a new spirit blowing within me that doesn't accentuate the pain of the past, but he accentuates the power of the cross to deliver me from that pain because now I can have a new attitude, and I am a new person, and the person who had all these bad things happen to them died. I have been crucified with Christ, Nevertheless, I live yet not, it, not I, it's Christ living in me, and he allows the wind of my spirit to pick up the breath of God to bring new dimensions to living and to bring true life into my heart. And the only, the first, the first pull on that sail is it's got to be the fear of God. If you don't get that into place, you're not going to get anything into place. Proverbs 1, 7 can, can be listed as most of the church. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and, and instruction. What is wisdom and instruction? Torah. The commandments of God. What do we do? We take the grace of God that set us free, and we use it as a weapon against the ways of God so that we don't have to do them because it's more convenient for us to let the old winds blow in this saved vessel. Turn to your neighbor and say, ouch. <sighs> so the very starting place of everything worthwhile is to have a deep fear, a deep respect for God. If we don't get that, you're never going to get your jubilee. Maybe one of the reasons why Israel never enforced something as radical as the jubilee is they didn't fear God.
to the point of obedience. Hmm. They feared man. What you mean I got to give this up? I don't want to move back down there. I want to be up here because you know how long it took for my family to sell that land and talk these people out of this land to get this? And, and God is saying, yeah, but I gave this land to this family and I give this land to this family. You get back where I put you. But, Lord, that's on the wrong side of the railroad track, maybe, even before they had railroad tracks. Oh, am I making sense this morning? Let's go to the next level. Proverbs 14, 26, and 27. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Oh, I just feel the anointing right now. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. How many like to get pulled out of the snares of death? How many like to have a strong confidence, to have a refuge? It begins with the fear of God because how do we lose confidence? Now, the word confidence in the Hebrew is mibtoch, which means to trust the confidence. I like this refuge, security, a state of confidence. You see, if I fear God, he's the only one I'm letting blow through me. I can have confidence in that because wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. The Holy Spirit brings freedom. The Holy Spirit brings creativity. The Holy Spirit bring, brings all the things of the kingdom with him. That's why the kingdom of God is within us because the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us and he brings confidence. And when I have fear, I quit listening to the other wind that's blowing. So next time the devil talks to you, just say, I'm not going to listen to your hot air. How many know hell is hot? And if a wind blows across it, it's just a bunch of hot air. And I don't know about you, but I want a refreshing breeze. You see, when it's 110 out, the last thing you want is a hot breeze. You want the cool breeze, don't you? The cool breeze is the breeze of the Holy Spirit. And it says, his children shall have a place of refuge. And what's coming, guys? Your only place of refuge on this planet is the fear of God. Not the fear of man. The fear of God. Because that, that fear, that, de that deep reverential fear of God will create a place of refuge for you. I like this, is a fountain of life, the breath of life. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of what? Living water. The fountain of life is directly tied into the fear of God. And so I've had a lot of Christians tell me, you know, Jesus promised that out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water, and I don't have it. Well, the truth is the potential is there, but you have tapped it off because there's no fear of God. You want that river bubbling up to do what your flesh wants instead of what God wants. That means there's, you fear what your flesh wants and what your stinking attitudes want to enforce instead of letting God crucify those things so that the river can flow through us for his agenda. Mm-mm-mm. This one I found I thought was really interesting. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and, all t and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is little reward on this earth. Great reward. But I, I, I like what it says here. It's clean. I looked at that and I said, of course it's clean. It's like, why did God have to state that? And then I looked up the Hebrew word tahor in the, in the Hebrew 
which means ceremonial clean, to be pure, to be morally and ethically clean. You see, if there's a foul wind blowing that created the fall and that enforces the fallen nature of man, God has got to define the clean from the unclean. (laughs) You don't get that unless you understand Torah. He's defining the holy from the unholy. The ceremonial claim to that which is defiled. The fear of the Lord is the first step to understanding the clean. You see, if you really feared God, if God said don't eat pork, that ought to be the end of the conversation for you. Don't even need to understand why. Don't even... Well, God's going to have to give me 47 points on why I shouldn't eat pork, and it better make sense to me. You don't fear him. He just said, don't. The same way he said, don't kill, don't murder. The same way he said, don't steal. Do you notice the Ten Commandments are pretty succinct? I'm the Lord God. I'm the one who delivered you out of Egypt. You worship me, me alone. You don't make graven images. The why our church is full of them. Sometimes churches will put up images, graven images of past preachers, and they give reverence to them. How do you know this is a violation of Scripture? Come on. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Well, you know, it's just as long as you recognize one day. God didn't give you the authority to pick a day. He did. Well, Jesus is my Sabbath. No, he's not. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. And if you take away the Sabbath, he's Lord of nothing. You see, if I, if I have the fear of God, it opens up the clean. God said, don't learn the way of the heathen. I cannot slap the name of Jesus on it and baptize it in advertising and make it something that's good. If I do that and I will fight you for my right to do that, you have no fear of God. If you say, you know, I don't care how great your argument is. God said, don't do it. I'm not doing it. And I won't do it until hell freezes over. And then even then I won't do it. Why? Because he said, I fear him. The fear of God enduring forever. How many know that when we said in the new heaven and new earth, the one thing that will, that will characterize that entire universe? Now, if you understand basic physics, which most of the church doesn't, when you get to the new heaven and new earth, that means God in a, he basically pulls apart the atomic structure that holds the universe together and it all goes up in flames. The greatest atomic explosion that will ever exist is not created by man. It will be created by God when this entire universe goes up in one nuclear explosion. The the, the nuclear cohesion, the atomic cohesion, because that's all atomic explosion is, is that cohesion is, is tore apart, and the energy released and it all falling apart is what we call an atomic explosion. How many know it isn't going to be water next time that judges it's going to be fire because the entire universe will cease to exist in one big flash of fire and god will create a whole new dimensional reality that lucifer has never existed in that sin has never touched imagine living in a universe that has never known pain imagine a universe that has never known sickness A universe that is so radically different, that the laws of physics are so radically different, you don't need to have a sun to have light. You don't need stars to have light. And the one thing that you will never find is a shadow. You can take a box, close it up, and it's still light on the inside. Because no darkness will ever, 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 ever touch that universe. But you know what will get into that universe? 
the fear of God. <laughs> Everything of that universe will have a deep-seated reverence for Almighty God. And the reason why there's never a shadow is because all of it yields to him who is the light. <laughs> so if you want to take something over with you, it's developing the fear of God now. Because that is how that entire universe will operate. Are you having fun yet? The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. I like that. We sang a song this morning, Ascribe unto the Lord. Truly and holy are your ways. Do you know where that is found in the Bible? It's while God is judging the earth in the book of Revelation and his bride is saying, you know what? Everything that you're doing is just and true. Yet right now, we have elements of the church, if you will, saying, well, if God don't want you, won't allow you to love what you choose to love outside of his commandments, I won't serve a God like that. I've even had people utter that over a stupid pork sandwich. I won't serve a God who won't let me eat pork. Then pork is your God. You know what the Apostle Paul says? Their belly is their God. You're showing what you fear the most when you say stuff like that. But the truth of the matter is God says that his judgments... And his righteousness are altogether perfect, and they'll go into that next kingdom. But they're wrapped up in this package called the fear of the Lord. Well, how great are they? More to be desired are they than gold. Well, there goes all that advertising on TV saying the only security that we have today is to buy gold and precious metals. You can get something this morning that is greater than all the gold in Fort Knox. That's greater than all the silver on the planet. It's the fear of God. I so fear God that he's the only one that I want to fill my spirit with the wind of heaven. I don't want the he wind of hell blowing anymore through areas of my life. I don't want the manifestation of chaos. That's why Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. Forget lip service. Forget how much they go to church. There have been many people that go to church every week that will bust hell wide open when they die. When you look at what's in their life, you can't find Jesus anywhere. If your only testimony that you're a believer is because you go to church on the weekend, you've got a poor testimony. When you start bringing divine order and healing and restoration, because of what's flowing through you to those around you, you've got the right wind blowing. And I like this one. Moreover, by them, your servant is warned. How am I warned? The devil is never going to get you to do the commandments of God for the right reason. He'll try to, try to taint them. Anybody ever see somebody who gets into Hebraic carriage, the next thing you know, they're a Torah terrorist? They're kosher police. Judging everybody. Well, you said, I wasn't judging you for eating pork. I'm actually judging people coming against me because I won't. But I don't judge them. That's between them and God. I found out obedience is better than sacrifice. But we have people terrorizing people over the commandments instead of encouraging them by them. That means you have another spirit perverting the commandments. It's a religious spirit. But see, the fear of God, I'm warned. Jesus said, by your fruits you shall know them. It's not what they speak. It's not, it's not where they're, what the, the, the outward expression. You step back and you look at what is their life producing. How much peace do they have in their homes? How much peace they got in their heart? Do they bring peace into a situation or do they bring chaos? 
You see, when the Holy Spirit's blowing through me and I'm walking in the fear of the Lord, I can have peace that passes all understanding. I just don't understand. I think he's half dead. That's why he's so peaceful. No. I've just learned to turn the deaf ear to the devil. And if I'm going through a hard situation, I can hold my ground because this too shall pass. God may have told you to go somewhere, and right now you're in the midst of the storm. How many know that instruction of God was not go halfway through and sink? We just need to make sure that the one who steals the storm is in the midst of the boat with us. If we could really open up our eyes, guys, we have a lot of believers that are in the boat, and at the same time they're the one conjuring up the storm by what they're doing and then trying to blame it on God. Because they opened up their sails to another spirit, trying to accomplish the things of God by the power of another spirit. The fear of God. By his judgments, by the fear, I am warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. Your first step to great reward in this life. I want, I want reward in this life, too, is the fear of God. If I can open up my sails to the Holy Spirit, my days of greatest creativity are now in front of me. My days of having joy when no one else has it is before me. My ability to bring the shalom of God into any situation is before me. And see, that's where you step into miracles. Where the devil has created lack, you step in with the blessing of God and you produce when nobody else can. That's why Jesus was able to take a couple of fish, a couple of loaves of bread, and feed a multitude, and there were 12 baskets left over. Why 12? He established divine government. With God's kingdom, God's economy, there's always more than enough. The devil always creates scarcity because he steals, he kills, and he destroys. Now, Father, I ask right now in this moment in our lives, Father, the, the one thing that you need to do more than anything in our lives is help establish us in a fear of you. Father, we cry out for the fear of the Lord. Father, if it's the beginning of wisdom, it's the beginning of knowledge. Father, we cry out that you would release within our spirits right now a reverential fear for you. That we confess this day, we will not fear the world. We will not fear man. But we will fear Almighty God and him alone. Father, we will live by the fear of the Lord and let us have the grace to die by the fear of the Lord and let everything in between be encompassed by the fear of God. Father, free us from this other fear because where there is the love of God perfected, it drives out fear, worldly type of fear, but it always establishes the reverential fear of God. And Father, we bind up any other spirit of fear. We bind it up right now in the name of Jesus. We cast it from us. We cast it from anyone who hears this message. Father, we bind up the demonic forces of the fear of the world, the fear of the flesh, and the fear of the devil. But Father, we loose upon us. Father, let it be bound upon us, the reverential fear of Almighty God, we ask in Jesus' name. 